Born to Annoy, From Rebel to Revolutionary, Chapter 7, Pastures New. The National Apprentice strike lasted about six weeks, and they returned to work victorious, and once again I and my colleagues benefited. The 2nd of July 1965 marked my 21st birthday and the end of my apprenticeship. I was now a junior draftsman, and my wage would be £13, 8 shillings and 4 pence, not much above that of a semi-school worker, and quite a bit less than that of a school fitter. Still, mustn't grumble. I went to work in a shirt and tie, worked slightly less hours than a blue boiler suit, and by the time I reached 30, the senior draftsman's rate might be a thousand quid a year. Dad was full of pride with his eldest son's achievements, and no doubt thought I was on the way to becoming middle class. Dolly and Beatty bought me a gold case rotary watch to celebrate my coming of age, and Maggie clasped me to her bosom, kissed me on the forehead, and bought me a pint of bitter. Not long after, I bought her one back, put my arm around her shoulder, and kissed her on the lips. To cap it all, Mum had returned home shortly before my birthday, and seemed to be coping quite well. Dad's smile became more permanent, and he had a new spring in his step. Despite these positive developments, by now I was becoming increasingly sexually frustrated. I'd had my moments. Memories of the seductress Susan still lingered. They'd been my romantic but unfulfilled dalliances with Valerie Crossley and Brenda Colley. I'd even lost my virginity, but not in the best of circumstances, when I was about nineteen. Nigel Crossley and I had chatted up two young women in the Bull's Head, and on learning they lived in High Lane, I'd volunteered to escort them to Rosehill Station, so they could catch the last train home. It was a freezing cold December night, and Nigel made a beeline for the waiting room, which had a coal fire. My new friend suggested we stay on the platform, and I, not wishing to cramp my mate's style, complied. We started necking. My partner had her back to the wall. She undid my overcoat and pulled it around her, and just as efficiently unzipped me. If I wasn't a gentleman, I'd tell you the outcome. Suffice it to say that the train came before I did. Thus it was, with my sexual desires unfulfilled and my hormones rampant, one particular day in 1965 I made my way to the standards department to find the answer to some query or other. I entered the office and looked around, wondering which of the busy people I should approach when my eyes alighted on a vision. Doreen had bottle blonde hair, and her eyes caught mine. I'd seen this woman before, but only at a distance. She must have been in her mid to late thirties, but dressed much younger. She always wore a short black skirt that clung to her shapely thighs and hips, and her ample and curvaceous derriere like a second skin. A pair of slender legs, whose shape was augmented by dark tan nylon stockings, with feet balanced on stiletto heels, disappeared into this pelmet of her skirt. Her slim waist was encased in a three-inch deep shiny black belt, and above this her upper body, enhanced by up-tilted breasts as shapely and firm as her backside, was encased in a white blouse. That translucent, her black bra, could be discerned beneath it. This bra in turn must have been made of a rather flimsy material. When I approached her to seek her assistance, two bullet-like shapes strained the material of her blouse, which was low-cut and surmounted by a bare and shapely cleavage. My lascivious eyes were busily undressing her, when I realised she was gazing at me with bright blue eyes from beneath long coal-black false eyelashes. Auntie Beatty would have tut-tutted at the amount of makeup with which her attractive face was painted, but it had been applied very carefully. Her face was a portrait, a portrait of seduction, and I was seduced. My heart palpitated, and my blood pressure rose, causing my blood to stream through my veins and arteries. The direction of blood flow must have been away from my head and brain, in the general direction of my crotch, because I felt quite faint for a moment. How can I help you? 
she asked. Oh, my goodness, the possible answers that came rushing to my over-imaginative and over-lustful mind. Luckily, I had the sense to stick to the problem in hand. The work problem, that is. This was the first of many encounters with the gorgeous Doreen, although I hasten to add they all came to nothing. Nonetheless, she inspired many a fantasy under the blankets of my lonely bed, despite my subsequent discovery. She was not only happily married, but had a daughter, only slightly younger than me. This situation was, of course, by no means satisfactory. However, it relieved the pressures produced by my out-of-control hormones somewhat, even if it did have a propensity to promote the growth of sex on the palm of my hand. There were, of course, plenty of young and attractive women of my own age working in the Edge Lane office block. The typing pool was full of them, and Manchester, not least because of its ethnic diversity and large gene pool, was blessed with female beauties of every hue. The trouble was there were plenty of young men available too, and most of the young women seemed to be courting, or married, or engaged to be married. I also suffered from the sin of shyness. I couldn't dance, except in my pedals when cycling uphill. In retrospect, I think another factor was at play. I have already mentioned I stopped having heroes when I discovered Tom Mix wasn't a real cowboy. However, there were people I respected and looked up to. The individuals had been the most influential in my young life, and to whom I still looked for a lead, and they, in the main, were women. Consequently, I tended to put the fair sex on a pedestal, and I think this may have affected my seductive abilities in a negative way. On the other hand, and perhaps more likely, it could have been that young women simply found me rather unattractive at that time. 1965 proved to be an interesting year in other ways. I finally got to ride a young dream. No, dear reader, not that kind of a ride. It was as a pillion rider on a Honda dream, owned by one of my fellow apprentices. We'd had dinner together in the staff canteen, and as we walked past the most bike section of the bike sheds, he stopped to show me his new mode of transport with obvious pride. A number of older men stood around tending their BSAs, AGSs, Villiers, Nortons and Triumphs. My mates suggested we take a quick turn around the block. I noticed the smirks on their faces as I climbed on the machine behind him. I waited for him to kick-start the vehicle. Instead he turned the ignition key and the bike's engine murmured into action. The smirks disappeared, and so did we, into Edison Street, onto Ashnall Road, and then down Fairfield Street, on a motorbike that purred like a cat. So much for Japanese rubbish. My apprentice friend assured me the British motorbike industry was doomed unless it shaped itself and invested in new technology and new ideas. How right his prophecy proved to be. Alas, just as they had done with the now terminally sick textile industry that had once propelled Britain to a position of leadership at the beginning of the industrial age and the now fast declining shipbuilding industry that had been developed on its back in the age of empire, the British industrialists would drain the motorbike industry dry and abandon it along with those who depended on it to earn their daily bread, content to invest their ill-gotten gains elsewhere and more often than not, overseas. Leading up to the Second World War, certain sections of the aristocracy were known as the traitor class, but by the 1960s, there were all too many wealthy middle-class capitalists who fitted that description. But then, as a wise old man named Karl Marx pointed out a long, long time ago, capital recognises no national boundaries, just as working people own no country. By the mid-1960s, with British manufacturing generally beginning to struggle through lack of capital investment, British-owned multinational companies were second only in terms of their profitability, size and influence to those owned by their capitalist counterparts of the United States of America. There are those, no doubt, who at this juncture will protest that no matter the sins of capitalists and their system, there is no alternative and certainly not a socialist one. However, as I was to discover later, just nine years previously, in the same year the Soviet Union crushed the progressive communist government in Hungary, 
and Sir Anthony Eden had embarked on his doomed Suez adventure, a small group of twenty-six men and women who resided in the village of Mondragon, comprising some seven thousand souls in the Basque country of Spain, a region then cruelly repressed by the fascist dictator Franco, had built themselves a foundry. They formed themselves into a workers' cooperative, manufacturing paraffin stoves under licence from a British company, eager to conquer new markets, but not so eager to invest in a new factory. By 1965, the Basque cooperators had inspired and assisted the formation of another 50 workers' cooperatives, and had set up and developed their own cooperative bank. These were to grow and develop under the umbrella of their own cooperative parliament and governing body, the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation. These examples of working-class enterprise were inspired not by Adam Smith and his ideas of competitive laissez-faire capitalism, nor by Karl Marx, but by those of our very own Robert Owen and the cooperative principles of the Rochdale pioneers, not least the thoroughly socialist principle that capital should be subordinate to the interests of labour, and that it, capital, should be recognised for what it really is, merely an instrument, a tool, a means by which labour could produce wealth for the common good. Since then, the Basque cooperators have proved beyond the shadow of a doubt there is no need for individual capitalists in order to run progressive high-tech industries. Not long after 1965, the original co-op manufacturing paraffin stoves was to become the largest single manufacturer of domestic appliances in the whole of Spain. Very few British workers were aware of these facts at the time, and all too few of them know about them today. It will be over a decade before I discover the truth, but the Basque cooperatives were, and remain to this day, a shining example of what can be achieved when capital remains outside private ownership and control, and is utilised for the common good, and subject to democratic control. If you haven't heard of them, Google the Mondragon experiment. We will return to this question later. In the meantime, I have to return to my lowly position as a white-collared wage slave in a factory where democracy had no place, and management insisted on their right to manage a highfalutin phrase which simply means their right to exercise a dictatorship on behalf of their masters. For at the end of the day, even old Padlas was himself a wage slave, albeit an extremely well-paid one. The annual work shut down that year loomed. One of my fellow apprentices asked me if I had made any arrangements to go on holiday. I hadn't, because I couldn't afford such luxuries. I'm going to Ireland. I want to visit Cork. Why don't you come with me? David had Argentine and British citizenship, but his ancestors were Irish and Scottish. His father was a bigwig in Argentine state railways, and one of his forebears was Admiral Cochrane, one of the liberators of Chile from Spanish rule. He was the proud possessor of a Triumph Spitfire sports car. The idea was to drive to Liverpool, embark on a ferry to Belfast, cut across Northern Ireland towards the far west, and then travel down to Cork, camping or staying at cheap guest houses on the way. It sounded great to me, and I'd be travelling through the land of my ancestors. We duly arrived at Liverpool, and the ferry was in dock. We waited and watched cattle being unloaded with slings underneath their bellies one by one. Then it was the turn for the car to be slung up onto the open deck in the same manner. This was in the days before roll-on, roll-off car ferries. The sea crossing was rough, but eventually we proceeded into Belfast Lock. Being July, it was coming to the end of the sectarian marching season, but we were amazed by the sights that greeted us. Poor, terraced slum housing, street after dismal, working-class street, row upon row, worse than anything in Manchester or Salford, and red, white and blue bunting everywhere, as if it was coronation year. Even more surprising, house window sills and pavement curbstones were painted red, white and blue, and there were more Union flags than I'd ever seen in my life. I might be English and from Protestant stock, but I felt intimidated and so did David. We drove through Northern Ireland without stopping till we reached a border crossing at a place which I think was called Black Lion. Here we were greeted by a watchtower, 
like those overlooking the Berlin Wall, with sandbag defences either side the road. It was a narrow lane, and every car was stopped and papers checked by officious members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary. There were also a small detachment of troops lurking in the background. Eventually, we were waved through, and escaped into what was to prove to be a far more relaxed and welcoming world, that of the Irish Republic. I should point out that at this time in its history, the IRA had decided to disband and abandon its military campaign and engage in democratic politics. The Northern Ireland Civil Rights Movement had begun their campaign against gerrymandering, corruption and sectarianism, and for equal rights for both Catholics and Protestants. They, like the earliest movements for home rule in the 19th century, were not only non-sectarian but comprised both Protestants and Catholics, as well as non-believers amongst their leadership. This alarmed the then Unionist rulers at Stormont far more than the IRA, and they were to crack down on peaceful protesters in a way which would shock many sections of British society. However, despite this traumatic introduction to the Emerald Isle, for me and my companion, it turned out to be a brilliant holiday. The Irish are mainly a rural people, and a people who have suffered more than their fair share of poverty, toil and trouble. In future years I would learn that where adversity and poverty are prevalent, a sense of humour, a love of simple amusements, particularly music, and a spirit of community and of solidarity with others also tend to prevail. Wherever we went in the Republic, we were met with kindness, good humour, and outstanding hospitality. The fact we were English mattered not a job, and we soon discovered that when we mentioned we were from Manchester, it opened up all kinds of enquiries and discussions. Some had worked there, many had relatives who had lived there. Would you be knowing me Uncle Seamus by any chance? He lives in a place called Burnish, and similar enquiries weren't unusual. My auntie Dolly had told me that one of my grandfather's old sayings had been, if you scratch a Mancunian, you'll find an Irishman underneath, and if he isn't Irish, he'll be Scots or Welsh or Jewish or German or Italian. This truism now became more meaningful to me. I won't bore you with all our adventures in Ireland, not least because it wasn't to be my last visit, but one incident is worth recalling. We'd arrived in County Clare, and eventually found a farmhouse that provided hospitality. We'd spent time having an evening meal and then received directions to the nearest village with the intention of finding a pub. We duly arrived on the edge of a small hamlet with a village green at which stood a member of the guardie. We approached the officer and asked him where the local pub was. He pointed to what looked like a village shop. See the stores, he said. Pat's bars in our ear. He paused and perused his watch. Where's yours from? he asked. Manchester. Right, he says. I've no doubt you like the crack. I've heard there's music in Manchester. It's two minutes to closing time. But if yous goes to Johnny's bar about half a mile that away, there's a session on tonight. We thanked him and began to retreat to the car. Bye's the way, he shouted. Tell Johnny I'll be in for a drink myself about midnight. As you will have realised by now, I regarded myself as a socialist, although in truth I was still grappling with the question of what I understood by the term. I still hadn't read any Marx or Engels, although I had read Self Help by the People, the History of the Rochdale Pioneers, and Robert Tressel's The Ragged Trousered Philanthropists, both of which I found inspirational. Despite my lack of clarity, an increasing number of people were now calling me a red, and in my case, when they did, they meant I was a communist, although I was not a member of the party and had no intention at that stage of becoming one. The images of Hungary remained in my mind, as well as those of the Berlin Wall, and Maggie had informed me of Khrushchev's revelations with regard to Stalin. As I have already stated, I had joined the Labour Party, intent on playing an active role in politics, but my first experience of attending a meeting at the Gorton Labour Club had not proved positive. When I walked in, a couple of shop stewards from the factory were holding court at the bar. They greeted me like a long-lost friend, and insisted on buying me a pint. Then they asked me if I wanted my name put in forward for the panel. 
I didn't have a clue what they were talking about and informed them I was there to attend the monthly ward meeting. You don't want to bother with that. It's just a load of old women talking about raising funds for the next election campaign. We'll put your name down for the panel. I was still no wiser as to what the panel was. So naturally, I asked and discovered it was the panel of potential candidates from which contestants for the council would be selected. I hadn't been a member of the Labour Party very long and was appalled by their attitude. Being a natural diplomat, I told them so in no uncertain terms and attended the ward meeting as I originally intended. As they had prophesied, I was the only male and the only youngster present. Nonetheless, I had the sense to understand that the raising of funds was important to any organisation and I didn't like the men's dismissive attitude to the women. The women welcomed me with open arms and for quite different reasons than the men, seeing me as an ally in their particular struggle. I subsequently realised this was not typical, but Gorton was a Labour stronghold in those days, and the proverbial donkey would have won a council seat, providing it had a Labour Party label. All a donkey had to do was to persuade other donkeys to place it on the panel, but I didn't regard myself as a donkey and wasn't impressed by the factory shop stewards who were. When I informed Maggie, she laughed, but she didn't censor me for having joined the Labour Party. My quest in mind wasn't concentrating purely on politics or economics, or even my sex life at this point. Other urges were at work. Manchester was a large place and its citizens were engaged in a wide variety of occupations. The engineering industry itself covered a wide spectrum of manufactories and disciplines, producing an infinite variety of products. The old urge to explore this world and gain new experiences began to work within me. I wanted to extend my knowledge and my skills. Consequently, I began scanning the job vacancy columns of the mainstream in news. Eventually, I came across one that intrigued me. Draftsman wanted to join small team designing air-operated hydraulic pumps. Apply Chief Draftsman, C.S. Madden & Company Limited, Atlantic Street, Broadheath, Altrincham, Cheshire. It was the early summer of 1967 when I applied for and got the job with Madden's. It was to prove to be an important step on a road that would not only change my life fundamentally, but would take me out of the engineering industry altogether, and even lead me into conflict with my dad. Firstly, I had to share the news of my intended change of employment with Phil Carr, in the form of my written notice of resignation. When I appeared at his desk and he had read the letter I handed to him, he immediately asked me to pull up a chair. What's up, young Malk? Are you not happy here? I explained it had nothing to do with happiness or unhappiness. I merely felt the need to move on and gain wider experience in engineering. Are you sure? It's not a matter of money, is it? I assured him it wasn't. Madden's a lousy payers just like AI and the rest of engineering. I informed him. Tell me about it, he retorted with a grin. He paused for a moment as though he wasn't sure what to say, but then said, If you ever want to come back, you'll always be welcome on my team, Mark. But contact me first. I might. He hesitated, but then continued. Well, it doesn't matter. Just contact me first. I had the feeling he was on the brink of divulging something, but I didn't press him. I had no intention of coming back. He stood up and so did I. We shook hands, and I knew I was shaking hands with a good man. Best of luck, young man. I hope you do well. If you carry out your work as you've done for me, you won't go far wrong, but try and curb your passions. I wondered which passions he meant, although I was to find out much later he meant my rebellious spirit. Although I thought, once I'd finally left the premises in a fortnight's time, we would never meet again, Mr. Philip Carr hadn't done with me yet, not by a long chalk. However, my career with Associated Electrical Industries, Switchgear Division, Higher Open Chalk, Manchester 11, was to all intents and purposes at an end. And, in the not too distant future, the existence of the mighty AI group itself would terminate, but much worse was to follow and people like, and including me, were partly to blame. My Auntie Dolly, when I had been a mere lad of eleven, 
had assured me my future lay in the engineering industry. She'd even foreseen if I studied and worked hard, I could become a draftsman. She had told me that once I had qualified as a skilled man, the world would be my oyster. What she didn't foresee, and couldn't foresee, was that Britain, once the workshop of the world and proud to be so, would turn its back on manufacturing, and the very term engineer would become a dirty word. The Nazis had blitzed Manchester's engineering factories, as they blitzed every manufacturing centre in the United Kingdom, but within the space of a few short years, an ignorant woman, the jumped-up daughter of a low middle-class grocer in Grantham, a man who had been completely reliant on working people for his and his dependents' livelihood, betrayed her country and its skilled and talented people, and brought its manufacturing and mining industries to their knees in a way and to a degree Hitler could never have dreamt possible. In order to do so, she would appeal to the lowest, basest, meanest and most avaricious instincts of the British people, and all too many of the people, including some Labour politicians, would lower themselves to her level. The same woman would show her commitment to democracy by befriending and attempting to shield from justice a military dictator who had overthrown a democratically elected government, rounded up his opponents in a football stadium and tortured and murdered them. She would also rear a son who in his turn would become a convicted international terrorist. Her name was Maggie Thatcher, but she too in that year of 1967 still lay in a dim and distant future.